This is the Multi-Faith Matters Podcast. I'm your host, John Moyer. I'm John Moorhead, and this is the podcast for Multi Faith Matters. And uh, I am privileged today to have as a guest Ryan P. Burge. Am I pronouncing that last name correctly, Ryan? You got you got, got it right. Yeah, I've been uh, enjoying his work, uh, seeing the articles that he's posted online and uh, through Twitter and things like that. As I keep in touch with what's going on with the changing American religious landscape, and he's got uh, a fantastic uh, new book out called "The Nuns: Where They Came From, Who They Are, and Where They Are Going." And I'll read his bio uh, on that book. It says, uh, Ryan is an assistant professor of political science at Eastern Illinois University, author of numerous journal articles. He is the co-founder and a frequent contributor to Religion and Public, a forum for scholars of religion and politics to make their work accessible to a general audience. Burge is a pastor in the American Baptist Church. Uh, welcome to the program, Ryan. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, I think you're one of my new heroes because you are combining together uh, two areas that I've combined in the past, both academic work, looking at uh, the social sciences and pastoral work. In my uh, past, I have done the interim pastorate, and I know what a challenge that can be. How, how did you come with this synthesis? How did you come to have the nuns and your area of research uh, interests? How did that all come together? Yeah, so just just some background on me. I, I started um, as a youth pastor when I was 20 years old, when I was an undergrad. Um, and it was going to be a three month uh, summer deal, you know, just take the kids to camp basically and do some summer activities and then go back to school. Well, it, it went so well, they kept me on for three years. And then, you know, that turned into being a, a pastor of a little church in Marion, Illinois for a year when I was in graduate school. I was doing the youth pastor thing when I was an undergraduate. Then I was uh, a pastor for one year at a small church in Marion as a graduate student my first year. And then I actually tried to walk away from the pastorate. And, and be a graduate assistant in grad school. Um, and a church called me and, and said, would you come preach? And you know, would you come preach? And then after two Sundays, I said, would you become our interim pastor? And then I, I've been the interim pastor for 14 and a half years now. Uh, I think I'm the longest, I'm actually the longest serving pastor in the history of the church, um, which dates back to the 1860s. Wow. So uh, I've always been, you know, I've always been involved in congregational life, you know, religious life. And I'm always, I've always enjoyed the the intellectual pursuit of academia. Uh, I like the academic environment. I like the collegiate environment. And actually, I took a year off between undergraduate and graduate. And realized that I miss so much the the thing that goes on at college, where you can talk about sort of the higher things, the bigger things, the more important things in the weather and baseball. You know, so I really wanted to get back because I'm always interested in understanding human behavior. Um, I, I think the one thing that I have for me is I'm just insanely curious about everything. You know, why is it that way? Or why can't we do it that way? Or why did that cost so much? Or why, you know, why, 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 right? And so social science is great because it gives you the tools to try to answer those why questions. And, you know, the, obviously, I probably think the biggest question facing American religion today is, you know, why were the nuns 5% of the population in 1972 and why are they, you know, around 30% of the population in 2020? You know, what caused this? I mean, in, in, in every possible way, that's a meteoric change. It's a cataclysmic, you know, catastrophic change to American religion. And I, you know, there are scholars that have written about this, but they've written about it for other scholars. They really didn't have intentions to write for pastors, you know, for Christians in the pews on Sunday morning. And, you know, they don't write in an accessible way. So I wanted to sort of be that bridge between the religion side, the pastorate side, because I can, I think like pastors think, I can think like that, you know, like I can understand what they want, right? What the, what, how they, you know, what the pieces of information they need are. But at the same time, I'm also a, a social scientist, so I can understand what the data is telling me and what it's not telling me and what questions I can ask and what questions I can't ask. And so I think it, it puts me in that really weird Venn diagram of, you know, academics, you know, rigorous academics on one side, but also pastors on the other side. There's not many people living in that in that center space. So I wanted to start tackling the bigger questions facing American religion. And I thought that the nuns, 
we're sort of first first up, you know, leadoff hitter when it comes to what people are interested in. And that's really where the book came from. Well, it's a great book. I've been enjoying it. Uh, we had uh, on the program here, Elizabeth Drescher came on a few weeks ago. and She's got a book out on the nuns. But yours has uh, far more recent data and you take a, a different kind of a approach to it. Um, what kind of a, a process are you have you used in your academic study of the nuns? What, what's your research process? Yeah, so I'm, I'm a quant, as, as they say now, quantitative uh, scholar of American religion, which means that uh, I deal with survey data. That's that's my only source material. And I think it's the best way to understand religion in a broad sense. I think that, I mean, I have a lot of friends who are qualitative scholars, those people who do things like focus groups, ethnographies, interviews, things like that. They're great, but they can't give you a broad-based picture of what American religion looks like because they can't interview 10,000 people or 20,000 people in depth. So surveys, I use two surveys in the book. One is called the General Social Survey, which is really the most important survey in social science in America. It's been going on since 1972. Uh, it's put together by the National Opinion Research Council, who are based out of the University of Chicago. It's a, it's a federally funded survey. It's, it's funded through the NIH um, grants, or NSF, National Science Foundation grants, and it's done biannually. Uh, it's been asking questions about all sorts of social processes, religion, politics, but also things like sexuality, drug use, you know, opinions on all, all variety of, of things, uh, you know, things like marriage and family and, and views of gay marriage and all this kind of stuff. It's really the only evidence, you know, the, we only have, that's really all we have going back to the, the 70s in terms of data. Um, but now there's a new survey that I've become very fond of called the Cooperative, Cooperative Congressional Election Study, which began in 2006. Um, a team out of Harvard started that. And that is done um, every year now. And the huge benefit to that is it's humongous. The sample size is around 60,000 people. Um, and to put that in comparison, the General Social Survey's average sample is about 2,200. So you can do a lot more things with 60,000 people than you can do with 2,200 people. And that really sort of unlocks all these doors that were locked up with a smaller sample size that allows us to look at, let's say, you know, atheists under the age of 30. Now I have a couple hundred I can look at instead of 12, right? So now I can start to make these broader claims about what these groups look like. I can break down smaller religious groups into men and women or young and old or black and or, or white, you know, so these two data sources to me, and by the way, there are more coming online every year. It seems like Nationscape just is going to release their last tranche of data. They interviewed 6,000 people every single week for 18 months. So the total sample size there is 500,000 people. So we're talking the GSS in 46 years has 65,000 people. The Nationscape interviewed 500,000 people in 18 months. So the ability for us to answer, ask and answer questions about religion, about politics is vastly improved today than it was improved even 10 years ago. So I want to sort of take advantage of these, 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 these events that have been happening without my, you know, I haven't done anything to get this data. They've done all of it, but I want to take advantage of that and make that, that data applicable and accessible to the average person. That's really what I see my academic career being about. And, and that's what the book's really about is like taking all that data and saying, here, look, this is what matters to you as pastors, as Christians, as average people. Well, one of the things I appreciate about uh, looking at your writings, not only in this book, but the stuff that you've had online, is uh, you're tackling questions and providing perspectives that we don't usually think about. Now, you said you started out in the pastorate, then you started your academic career. When you made that shift, what, what kinds of things were surprising what jumped out to, to you as you straddled both worlds to see how the American religious landscape was changing it's it's honestly I'm always surprised by how how there's so many basic findings about religion in, in America that we all just assume to be true but really aren't true you know there's all this stuff that we just kind of accept as gospel you know truth in the academic world that if you actually put it under some scrutiny you realize it's just not what you think it is you know for instance, a lot of what I publish online are what are called descriptive results. And descriptive results are just things like, how did Mormons vote in 2016? Just a little simple graph. That kind of work actually doesn't have a huge place in academic political science um, because journals are, are focused on like, you know, rigorous hypothesis testing and you want very fancy statistical models and you want, you know, these very niche journals written for very small audiences. So descriptive results won't get you published in basically any journal in, in political science or social science now. 
So what I wanted to do is sort of fill that void where people can cite my work online when they're trying to build an argument in their journal articles, but really didn't have anything to cite or it was old or it was you know not very good. So what I really wanted to do was I wanted to get my head out of the clouds. The thing about, about graduate school they teach you is how like I took six hours of graduate level statistics. Uh, you know, that works really well if you want to publish in some really prestigious political science journals. It doesn't do so well when you're trying to tell a pastor what percentage of Americans become religiously unaffiliated. So I didn't take any classes in graphing. Zero. I took zero classes in data visualization in graduate school, but I could teach you how to do a, a, a binomial uh, logit model right now. You know, so like the things I was learning are not the things I wanted to do. And so I thought, you know what, I'm going to find this little this little band in, in what I do and then just kind of provide all this descriptive stuff. And now I'm hearing professors, you know, we see them link it link to it in their online learning platforms, right? Their Blackboard, their Canvas or whatever they use, because they're using our work to teach undergraduates about religion and politics because they couldn't find anything else you know, about descriptive results that like a, a 20 year old can read and understand. So that's sort of the audience we wanted to hit on was that audience where they, they're interested, they want to have good rigorous work, but they don't want it to be so fancy. They can't understand it. They don't want to be these long, you know, people write 2000, 3000 word blog posts. Mm -mm. We do 800 words. We do three, four graphs and we're out. You know, we want you to read the whole thing and digest it in five to 10 minutes. I think that is what a, a, a part of political science that we've all forgotten is that everyone cares about what we do. So let's make it easier to help them understand what we do. And for me, that's in the religion and politics space because no one was doing it, at least the way I think I'm doing it now and making it sort of bridging the divide between the academic side and the, and the practical side. Yeah, I find your work very accessible, even though I've got uh, an academic background myself. But I, I know when I go to a, a blog, if, if it's a lengthy article, even if it's a good one, I mean, I'm just skimming just because I find it tedious personally to read online. Um, I could do it with a book or a journal or something, but just not online. So you, the way you're doing it, I think is very accessible. In terms of the nuns, when I see a lot of the, the media coverage, there, there's a tendency to, to paint it largely as a rise in atheism, agnosticism, skepticism, and that's certainly in the mix. But can you talk a little about the, the diversity and the, the makeup of the nuns? Yeah, I think that's really, if I could say, like, what's the takeaway from the book, that especially for pastors they need to be thinking about is, I think that, unfortunately, pastors have sort of made a boogeyman um, out of the nuns by talking about atheists all the time. Um, you know, Dawkins, Hitchens, Sam Harris, these kind of guys, they're the ones who get all the play in the media, and they, they, they become like the, the, the villain for a lot of evangelicals, I think, is, oh, we're not Dawkins, we're not Hitchens, you know, we're secular humanism, all these kind of things. So if you think about what America looks like, 6% of America is atheist and another 6% is agnostic, but then over 20% of America is a group called nothing in particular, which is actually the response option at the bottom of the survey it gives you, it gives you 11, 12 options actually. And, you know, it goes things like Protestant, Catholic, Mormon, Orthodox, Jewish, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, atheist, agnostic, and then nothing in particular. 21% of Americans now choose that nothing in particular option. They're, they're tied for the largest religious group in America today with Catholics and evangelicals. So, you know, we, we, we spend so much time thinking about atheists, but in reality, 60% of nuns are not atheists or agnostics. They're nothing in particulars, and they're, they're dramatically different. Nothing in particulars are as a social group than atheists and agnostics. Atheists have very high levels of education. 45% of atheists have a, a four-year college degree, um, which makes them one of the most educated religious groups in America today. They, they fall like second or third on the list. The least educated religious group in America today are nothing in particular. Only 19% of them have a four-year college degree. It's literally the bottom. So 44% versus you know 19%, that's a huge gap. And that bears out in income. Atheists uh, are much more likely to make $100,000 a year or more than nothing in particulars are. You know, most nothing in particulars, the median income for nothing in particular is right around $50,000 a year, which is right around federal poverty. So this is a different group. Um, they're not liberal politically, like atheists and agnostics are very liberal. I mean, atheists are the most liberal group and agnostics are right behind them. Nothing in particular is actually right smack in the middle of the political ideological spectrum. They kind of look like America politically. But when it comes to engagement, they're not engaged at all in politics. They're, they're the least active political group. They don't go to rallies. They don't go to protests. They don't put up yard signs. They don't vote, right? It's because low education, low income, right? 
So there, to me, it, it, when we when we create the straw man, like movies like God's Not Dead, creates the straw man of like the atheist philosophy professor trying to tell everybody God's not dead. Most people don't say God's dead. They say, I don't even think about it. You know, like I'm, I'm shrugging at the question, right? That is really where most nuns are. They're in the shrug, ambiguous, ambivalent category, as opposed to being actively opposed to religion. So what, what is the rest of the makeup of the nuns? Were, were you able to uncover it seems like if if that's a small percentage and they're still pursuing some kind of spirituality, some spiritual pathway, it's just not mm -hmm. that they're, they're turned off by institutional mainstream religion is my understanding. And correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. So if that's correct, what, what are the types of things are they pursuing? So a lot of them are really, I, I call them the disaffected, the left behind, the unmoored, the unattached. That's who the nothing in particular are. And like we talked about educationally, they didn't go to college. And, and you know, that's one of the structures that sort of ties you to American society as a whole, creates these networks for yourself. You know, in my mind, they're the kind of people who try to go to college but dropped out because they didn't like a professor, or you know, they had financial problems, or they just couldn't figure out how to get through classes. Um, they're not like we talk about, they're not politically involved. But I also think, you know, they're the kind of people who are really sort of casualties of globalization in that their parents could do what they did, which means go to, go to college, you know, don't even go to college, go to high school, finish, go work in a factory, make a nice middle-class income, take one vacation a year, buy a new car every three or four years and live a reasonably comfortable life, right? Which was true 30 or 40 years ago in America. They tried to take the same path as their parents and grandparents did, except the jobs that used to pay $30 an hour now pay $14 an hour. And they're the ones struggling, in, you know, how to work in a globalized world when they don't have a ton of special skills or special training or special education, right? So they're sort of being left out, left behind. They feel like politics doesn't work for them. They feel like government doesn't work for them. They feel like religion doesn't work for them. They feel like education doesn't work for them. That is, atheists are the opposite of that, by the way. High income, high education, very connected, very, they have purpose. And their purpose is liberal politics more often than not. Nothing in particular is don't really have much. I sort of picture them as 30 or 40 year olds, couple kids, you know, barely scraping by, making forty, fifty thousand dollars a year. Really can't go anywhere. Really can't do anything. You know, they might lose their job, and many of them lost their job during the pandemic because a lot of them worked in service type jobs that went away. Those are the people who are being left behind in these nothing particulars. Atheists are they're doing very well. Most of them actually probably did better during the pandemic um, because of stimulus and everything else. So that's they're just dramatically different groups. And when it comes to religion. Nothing in particular is about 35% of them say they go to church at least once a year. Um, so they're not, you know, sort of locked off religion like atheists are when it's less than 3% or agnostics when it's less than 10%, right? So they actually still go to church and about 35 or 40% of them say that religion is at least somewhat important in their lives. You know, for atheists, it's less than 3%. For agnostics, it's less than 5%. So they're not opposed to religion. They just seem like they're sort of floating in space and don't feel attached to it in any way. Are they tapping into it at all uh, what used to be called alternative religious expressions like new age, pagan ideas, nature, spirituality, any of that? It doesn't seem like that. I can't see that in the data, but my general sense is they, they're just not attached to anything. Well, wow, okay. Um, you know, they, so there's this um, interesting podcast I listened to. And when I listened to it, I thought, well, this is, this is the nothing in particulars. It's about this guy who, um, story I just told you, right? He's, he went to college after two years, dropped out because he couldn't make it. You know, he started partying, things like that. He went back to a small hometown, worked at Dairy Queen as the manager of Dairy Queen, small town, right? So it didn't make a whole lot of money, really wasn't working head. And YouTube sort of became his religion, you know, sort of became his entertainment space. And, and the story is really about how YouTube and the algorithm pulled him to the very far right of the political fringe, actually kind of the alt right, the scary right, at one point, and then somehow he got hooked into a new YouTube algorithm and pulled himself to the left side, and he became like a Bernie Sanders socialist all within the span of a year. I think that's really what the nothing in particular is. Or they're looking for something. They're looking for something that's it's in their hand, right? So things like TikTok, things like YouTube, things like Facebook are where they really find meaning and purpose, or things like video games, let's say, or online communities. Like that's where they're finding meaning and purpose. They're not finding it in traditional avenues. Now, sometimes I think that does – I think some of those things can be spiritual, by the way. You know, politics for some people is spiritual, but they're not, um, you know, paganism, you know, Wiccans, 
uh, Jedi's, like these alternative religious groups, I think the media plays them up a lot more because they're interesting than that they're actually growing in any sort of you know, s- systemically significant way nationwide. We're not seeing like a huge burst of paganism or anything like that, you know, nationally at least. So it sounds like there's the uh, sacralization process going on. They're taking, finding meaning and spiritualizing, if you will, I- existing things, which is a fascinating development in religion in itself. Yep. yep. Okay. Uh, you Now you mentioned that politics uh, wasn't working for them. I thought I saw after the last presidential election uh, some media pieces that talked about a large number of nuns that had voted for Biden and this represented a significant shift in the electorate. How do those two things relate? Yeah, so I actually just finished writing a piece this morning about the the, the irreligious vote in in 2020 and how it how it switched from 2016. Um, atheists, 78 percent of atheists voted for Clinton uh, in 2016, and 14 percent voted for for Trump in 2016, but then 8% voted for a third party candidate. Now in 2020, uh, Biden got to 85% of the atheist vote, which is the highest he's ever gotten. Um, Obama only got to 82. So Biden even did much, he did better amongst atheists and much better than Clinton. It's plus seven. Um, and Trump lost a couple points. Amongst agnostics, you see that amongst agnostics, here's something really fascinating. Um, Biden got 10 points better than Clinton did. So, you know, the agnostic vote was actually trending a little bit towards the Republicans the last couple election cycles, and it trended hard, you know, very strongly towards the Democrats this time. But then the nothing in particular vote, you know, um, John McCain only got 28 percent of the nothing in particular vote in 2008, and then Trump got 37 percent in 2016. So he did 10 points better, but then he lost a couple points in 2020, and then Biden picked up seven points on Clinton. So this nothing in particular vote trended back towards um, back towards the Democrats. The nuts, see, so there's this thing that's going on in American religion now where, you know, to be white and Christian is to be Republican in this country, overwhelmingly, and not just, not just evangelicals. Uh, we see even white mainliners are trending towards the Republicans. We see white Catholics trending towards the Republicans. So we see this trend on one side of white Christians becoming more and more Republican over time. The reason that's not sweeping the country, though, is the counterbalance is the nuns are getting larger and they're staying as blue as they were 10 years ago or 15 years ago. We would think when a group becomes such a large part of the population, it would become more politically diverse, but it's actually not becoming politically diverse. It's actually becoming more politically unified, which is telling you that people are tying together this idea of to be a Republican, especially for a white person, to be a Republican is to be a Christian and to be a secular person is to be a Democrat. So that political polarization is actually sort of sorting itself down to religious polarization where you have, you know, there are very few, and people don't believe me when I say this, there are very few white Christian liberals in this country anymore. There used to be a lot, but over time that sorted itself out now where to be a white Christian is to be a Republican. In 1978, half of white weekly churchgoers in America were Democrats and 35% were Republicans. Today, it's 50% are Republicans and 25% are Democrats. So we've seen this tremendous change in America over the last 40 years. And essentially, you know, white Christianity in America has become Republican Christianity. And everybody else tends to be, if they leave, they tend to leave, at least in part for political reasons. I talk about that in a little bit in the book. If you are enjoying this podcast, please consider becoming a part by sharing on social media, clicking the like, and visiting our patrons page and website donation page. You can find the links on the program notes and YouTube comments. Thank you for your partnership. Now back to the program. Is the is that phenomenon, the identification with uh, of white Christians with republicanism, does that have any connection to the Christian nationalism that we've heard so much about? I, I think it's, I think, yeah, I think Christian nationalism is a subset of white evangelical or white Republican Christians, right? I don't think that all white Republican voters are Christian nationalists, but I do think that there's there's definitely a strain of Christian nationalism. And even I heard it 20 years ago, growing up in a Southern Baptist church, I heard things like, you know, that we're God's anointed country, um, things like that. We were chosen by God and almost, you know, venerating the founding fathers, like they were sort of like saints on earth, like they were God's instruments to bring about like freedom across the globe. That kind of Christian nationalism is sort of metastasized, I would say. And I actually saw... The corner of the county I grew up in, who's far to the right, I mean, far to the right, posted a meme that said there is exponentially more evidence that Jesus rose from the grave than that Joe Biden won the 2020 presidential election. 
Um, wow. And I was, I was really taken aback by that for a, I mean, that was like, wow, like that's where we've gotten to where, right. you know, I mean, we can argue all day long about the historical person of Jesus Christ, but we literally had 80 million people that voted for Joe Biden four months ago who can testify in court under oath. They voted for Joe Biden and some, in some way there's that's, that's less provable to them than the idea that Jesus died on a cross in, you know, in, in Palestine 2000 years ago when we did not have any, any written evidence besides the gospels, right? It's just beyond me, like how these certain things have been codified amongst white Republicans, especially. And I don't think everyone is, is that extreme. I think a lot of people voted for Trump because he's not a Democrat, right? I think that's, that's where a lot of people are in American politics, but I've never seen someone post signs of a political candidate six months after he lost an election. And I've seen that all over where I live in rural America right now. Like no one posted Hillary Clinton signs anywhere in America six year, six months after Hillary Clinton lost the 2016 presidential election. There's something about Trump that has really just goosed up a lot of this Christian nationalism, a lot of this culture war, whatever you want to call it, this political polarization. And I think the one thing about him that's super interesting to me is most Republicans tried to at least tamp that down, you know, tried to steer the conversation away from things like immigration, like nationalism. For instance, you know, in, in 2008, John McCain had a town hall meeting in Minnesota where a woman got the microphone and said, I don't trust Obama. He's a Muslim. He's not an American. He's a terrorist. And he, you know, McCain, God love him. He went up and grabbed the mic from the woman and said, no, no, cut her off. Said, no, 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 no. He's a good man. He's a family man. You know, he's an American citizen. I just disagree with him on some policy. So he saw the rocks and steered the boat away from the rocks. Trump, steered toward the rocks and hit the throttle, right? He said, we are going to be Christian nationalists. We are going to focus on things like immigration. And I think that sort of energized his base, but also it, it cleaved America in a lot of ways between, you know, are you with us or are you against us? And I think that was a really good strategy in 2016, but I think it proved to be a little bit less, you know, advantageous in 2020 because we saw the third party vote was actually really robust in 2016. A lot of people voted for Evan McMullen and Gary Johnson and Jill Stein. We saw that third party vote really disappear and almost all those third party voters went for Biden this time. And that's one of the reasons that he won, that he won back those third party votes. Well, that that meme sounds pretty atrocious. I did see uh, that Twitter post. I suppose it could have been worse. There could have been a meme of Trump with the words he has risen uh, <laughs> over it. They've been, they've been predicting, you know, him coming back and, and holding office here for quite some time, but I, hopefully that'll, they'll let that go. Now, yeah. you, there, there's something you mentioned in the book about uh, two things that we can't do anything about. You talked about globalization mm -hmm. and their secularization. I wonder if you could un unpack those a little bit and how they relate to the nuns. And on secular uh, secularization, mm -hmm. help me understand, as I've looked at it in the past, you've had folks like Peter Berger, uh, who put forward the secularization uh, thesis, the idea that as society got uh, more educated, uh, we would adopt a scientific worldview, religion would mm -hmm. largely disappear, we'd become secular. And he eventually dropped that uh, because it didn't happen. With secularization, are you talking about a different kind, a different form, where mm -hmm. it changes the way in which we engage in relig religiosity? Help me understand that. Yeah, so secularization, I take it in the book, I take it back to Max Faber, which is sort of like the foundational social scientist, where he he called it, he used this German word, which I won't use, but it's 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 translated disenchantment. But it's also, and I talk about in the book how it could be translated as demagication, is what, you know, is really kind of a better way to look at it. And what Weber talks about when comes to secularization is that we used to live in a world where everything was magic. You know, we didn't understand why it rained. We didn't understand um, why our kids got sick and died. Right. We didn't understand droughts. We didn't understand floods. And remember, if you're living in an agrarian society, agricultural based society, rain matters a lot. Right. So when it didn't rain, you had to sort of make sense of why it didn't rain. If you didn't understand meteorological patterns, climatology, your only other explanation was it was God punishing us for doing something wrong. And so what Weber said was that, you know, religion becomes a way to control people's behavior because it helped people say, don't steal. Don't lie. Don't cheat. Why? Because if you do those things, it won't rain. If it won't rain, crops won't grow. If crops don't grow, we're all going to die of starvation. So do the right thing. It was a way to control populations. And cultural anthropologists have been talking about this for a long time. That, that This is the way that societies, when they were small, you know, eight or 10 or 12 people, kind of nomads around, you didn't need this because families help people in line. But when societies got bigger because of agriculture, 
you needed some sort of external control and that became God, right? So what Weber says is as science came along, we realized that the reason it rains or doesn't rain is not because I sinned. It's because of climatology and weather patterns. And why does my kid die? Because he got infected and he can get, you know, get better with an antibiotic or get a vaccine so he doesn't get sick. So essentially what happened was all the things that became unexplainable in the world were now explainable through science. And in some ways, science replaced God. It replaced the unknown because now we know things. But unfortunately, what's happened, and I think, you know, Weber was alive that he would talk about this. He would say that science has almost become its own religion in some ways. And it's, it's, it's jumped out of its lane and tries to explain things that it really can't explain. You know, there are some things in life that are unexplainable. Um, you know, what is love? What is joy? What is peace, right? Science has tried to explain those things and can't do it because they're trying to answer questions they're not equipped to ask, right? So I think that's, that. to me, that's what secularization has done, though, is it has, it has convinced people that science will answer all your problems, that science will solve all the things that are wrong in American society. And I think we can all admit that that's just not the case. So what we've seen, though, in America is what we saw in Europe post-war. In the post-war period, Amer uh, Europe, especially Western Europe, well, even Eastern Europe because of communism, that's a different story. But Western Europe radically secularized. You know, in the book, I talk about it. You know, there are countries that are astonishingly irreligious. You know, some countries where less than 10% of people go to church once a week or more. And these are big countries, Spain, France, um, Britain, you know, Portugal. It's countries that, you know, we would consider to be even Catholic, have strong Catholic roots. Even Italy is not an incredibly religious country despite the fact the Vatican's there, right? So what Weber said was, secularization, anytime a country gets more educated, it's going to become more secular. And what happened in Europe, to me, it was going to eventually happen to America, just slower than what had happened in Europe, because I think America is different in that we never had a state religion. Um, I know a lot of Christian nationalists wish we had a state religion, but if you really want religion to flourish in America, I think having pluralism actually allows religion to flourish because you don't get this resentment built up. And a lot of Europeans are resentful for religion because if you look at their history, they fought hundreds and uh, hundreds of years of wars over Catholic versus Protestant, right? Or the Inquisition um, against Muslims, right? So there's all these wars that were fought in Europe over religion that we didn't get here. And they had state religion, which means, you know what people love to do? rebel against government and rebel against establishment. America never established a religion, so we had pluralism. And even in, in America today, there are very few counties where one religion dominates. You might have different kinds of Protestants, or Catholics might be 40% or even maybe 50%, but you've also got a lot of Protestants too and a lot of Jews. So that kind of insulated us, I think, from secularism in a long way because we didn't have that resentment against religion. And I think America, for reasons that we'll never be able to measure or explain, is just a stubbornly religious country. You know, it's sort of woven into the fabric of who we are. We have a civic religion. Um, and I think we're never going to kind of throw that all the way off. So I just think what we're seeing here is what was going to happen eventually happened here. It's just happening slower. And it's going to hit us. It's going to hit a wall. Um, in Europe, it never hit a wall. It got to 75, 80 percent. In America, I think it's going to hit a wall at around 45 or 50 percent. So we're never going to be as secular as Europe for the, the reasons I just laid out in terms of, you know, our history, especially. Since you you combine the academics with the pastoral, uh, I wonder if you could kind of speak to that for, for pastors and church leaders, um, mm -hmm. how this comes together. I mean, when I, when I see uh, things that uh, Christians are writing and publishing and putting out in, in journals and, and magazines and this kind of thing, it seems like it's there, there isn't much recognition that I can perceive of how the, the landscape has changed. It's the same same foes, quote unquote, it's still atheism, secularism, godlessness, and this kind of thing. There, there really is no recognition of the dramatic change. And if we could just, you know, those who have left are usually uh, demonized in a sense. Well, they didn't have enough faith. I've seen some try to come to grips with it and say, well, they weren't really committed anyway. And so mm -hmm. this is just kind of getting the dead wood out. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what's your, your take on the pastoral yeah. landscape and how well we're prepared or not prepared for this. Can I just say I, that sentiment you just expressed that a lot of people express, you know, like, Oh, now we're, now we're left with the real Christians. Right. Right. It's so incredibly toxic that, and I wish more people would, 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 would really think about what they're saying in a real way, because here's what you're saying. You're saying the only people that are, that belong in church, the real committed believers that we don't have any room for lukewarm folks here. And, and maybe I'm wrong about the gospel, but I believe the gospel is for everybody. 
And I believe the more opportunity that the church has to preach the gospel to more people is a is an objectively good thing. So I'm a, I'm a believer that I don't care why people come to church. I don't care if they came for a girlfriend or a boyfriend or because they're serving a hot meal after the service. I don't care because if they, they're going because they want a handout. Well, at least when they're sitting there for that hour, they're hearing the word and they're hearing the gospel being preached. And isn't that isn't that a, a net positive? I mean, like to me, if we only had people in the pews who are committed believers, then we should stop evangelization entirely because right. you're not preaching the gospel to those halfway commit. To me, like I, I just, I, I just, I very much dislike this refining movement that seems to be happening amongst evangelicals, where it's we drove out the moderates in the '80s and the '90s. And now we're just driving out the kind of conservatives because we want to be super. We'd rather be instead of being twenty percent and a little bit more politically homogenous. We want to be twelve percent and all the same politically. And and to me, and I talk about this in the book. If you think that's true, then you got two things to un- help me understand. One is how do you think that African American Protestants are not Christians because they vote for the Democratic Party? I mean, was Martin Luther King a Christian? Because if he is, then you can be a Christian and a Democrat. Because I have friends who tell me you cannot. You cannot vote for Democrats and be a Christian. I think that's objectively false, and not only false, but dangerous to the church in America. The other thing is, is if you are going to be political, or do you know that you are turning off at least half of your potential audience, if not more, if you're going to be blindly partisan towards one party or another? I mean, I have many pastors who I'm friends with on Facebook that literally post three or four things a day that are anti one party and pro the other party. So you're saying to your potential audience, if you voted for for Joe Biden, let's say, then you don't belong here. Then you will not feel welcome in my church. And so what you're essentially saying is you deserve damnation because you voted for someone that I disagree with. I mean, I think we need to call it for what it is. That is caustic. That is corrosive. That is anti-kingdom in my estimation, and yet it has come. It has been unchecked in American religion. No one stands up and says, hey, 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 shouldn't we give a little bit of time to the other side? Shouldn't we, you know, check our language and the way that we're talking about people who we disagree with? Not to go too far afield here, but I was reading this really interesting story. You know, Matt Gates, the Florida congressman who's in a lot of trouble right now for right. sexual escapades. There's a story that came out in the Washington Post yesterday that said that he had shown pictures of naked women to other members of Congress on the floor multiple times. And a, a wonderful female commentator wrote, I think this is so precious, he goes, the fact that he did it more than once tells you the first time he did it, no one called him out on it. And I thought that was so incredibly incisive. Pastors, we need to be calling other pastors to account when we hear them saying things that are racist, that are sexist, that are xenophobic, that are anti-Christian. Because if you don't call them out, they're going to keep doing it. And if you see pastors being blindly partisan and calling the other party evil, right, we need to call that out and say they're not evil. They're different. And different is not wrong. It's different. You know, that's the kind of, unfortunately, our silence becomes complicity. And now I'm not saying that we should all vote for Democrats. Hear me very clearly. I think the church is better when the church has Democrats, Republicans, and independents all sitting in the same pew, singing the same hymns, and hearing the same sermon every Sunday. That's when we the church is the strongest because it builds bridges across the partisan gaps. Right now, there's no bridges. We're shooting arrows, flaming you know, uh, poisonous arrows at each other across the gaps. That is caustic. For the American, for the American church, but also for American democracy, which we all, you know, want to preserve. So I, I think that's something I need. To, I need pastors to think about that more. If you're being partisan, why are you being partisan? And are you turning people off because of your partisanship? Because I think the answer is probably yes. So in addition to the the political aspects, and I appreciate that, that pastoral critique. Um, as you talk to other pastors, do you do you have the sense that they're adequately prepared to, to minister to and address this changing landscape it, to, to bring a helpful critique to it. We're not trying to point mm-hmm. fingers and, and woe and you. No. We won't, we're concerned about the health of the church. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a very good point. I think on this, I think, I think on the politics thing, I think they're, they're, it's a little bit more malicious, I think, but I think on just the, the religious, you know, the, the social side, I think they're just more, they haven't thought about it adequately and understood the problem in the right way. And I, you know, my, my tips and, you know, my advice to pastors would be this, 
Um, nothing in particular is really desperately need the social part of church. I think even more so, at least at this stage, than the theological part of church. I think that, especially in a, in a pandemic world, uh, hopefully post-pandemic world, where we're all dying for human connection and dying for socialization, we, we forget the fact that the church at the end of the day is a social organization that just so happens to have a theological component to it. And we make everything theological, I think, even when it doesn't need to be. And, and you know, so hear me out. Like, why not just have a barbecue or have, you know, a bags tournament or have just a social event where there's no devotional, there's no preaching, there's no praise and worship singing. You just come and hang out with people in your community and the church creates a safe space, you know, a, a welcoming and inviting space for people who are 85 or eight or, you know, eight months old to come and just sit around tables and enjoy food and, and enjoy talking with other people. Begin with those kind of social events. Cause I think, like I said, I think we're desperate for those social events to return and you can even do them outside now because the weather's getting nice. So do a barbecue, do an out, uh, do a barbecue on the church lawn and invite everybody and don't hand out Bibles and tracts and don't preach the gospel. Just hang out, enjoy each other's company. I think that nothing in particular will realize, wow, like I actually missed people. I actually like hanging out with these people. And then, you know what? They're going to come to church. If they like what they're what they're seeing and what they're feeling and what they're doing, they're going to come. Let them come for the wrong reasons. They'll stay for the right reasons eventually, right? But focus on the social aspect first, because for a lot of them, they're sort of, they're, they're abrasive when it comes to religion. They're, they're kind of, you know, repellent to that idea. So don't lead with it. Lead with the social thing. And you know what? If they only do the social stuff, who cares? At least they're getting, you know, their lives are better because the church is part of it. Now, eventually, let's hope they do become members, you know, do join the church. But that's not the goal. The goal is to create community, right, to create a sense of belonging and togetherness. And if the evangelization thing happens, that's that's good. But that should not, especially right now where we are in the world, that's not the focus. The other thing, and I wrote a piece for the Gospel Coalition about this, is can we stop debating atheists? It's just a waste of time. I mean, it's just all academic, intellectual exercise that, listen, um, Philip Yancey said no one ever became a Christian because they lost the argument. You know, it's just people don't want the argument. They don't want the philosophical debate. They just want to have people that love them and care about them that will be there if they get sick. Right. That's what they want. So church needs to be thinking more about that and a little bit less about apologetics and trying to argue with Sam Harris. Yeah, as much as I appreciate the, the work of some apologists that are out there, I, I really think, in my opinion, somebody who came out of an apologetics mindset years ago, um, I think it really, it does more for us to make us feel better and confirm our faith, and it does persuade others. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, what kind of resources would you encourage pastors to seek out to be better equipped to to address this kind of thing, whether it's the nuns or, or what have you with the changing American landscape? Well, I mean, obviously my books. Good obviously. Uh, obviously. Would, it will be, yeah. we're going to include a, a link to it in uh, the podcast notes and it uh, will be on our, our website as a recommended resource. So what, what awesome. in addition to your book, what else would mm -hmm. you recommend? So um, I, I write all kinds of other stuff too for Christianity Today, for Religion News Service, right? For our own website, Religion and Public, which you mentioned at the beginning. And a lot of it is not about politics. A lot of it's just about church stuff. And for instance, I have a piece coming out in Christianity Today this week about um, retention rates in the Southern Baptist Convention and breaking it down by gender, race, and age, trying to see what factors led people to leave the Southern Baptist over time. So like I'm writing about, uh, you know, everything that, that has to do with American religion, but I do think um, <clears throat> Barna does a great job. You know, the Barna organization always is publishing data on this stuff. And Lifeway also does a very nice job of publishing all this kind of stuff. And, you know, the reality is, I think that Christian, that pastors especially need to be more attuned to non-religious, you know, media sources sometimes. I think there's some tremendous religion writing coming out of mainstream, you know, publications. Like, I think the team at the Washington Post, the religion team there is doing an excellent, excellent job really breaking down religion stories, things that matter. Um, I think the, the New York Times has Ruth Graham now, and she wrote a great story about evangelicals and, and vaccine hesitancy yesterday and about trying to overcome that amongst uh, white evangelicals especially. So I would, I would say, you know, pastors, get out of your silo a little bit and start looking at these mainstream outlets. By the way, most of those reporters are Christians themselves. So they're not writing about religion like it's like an animal at the zoo, 
you know, right? They're writing about it like with a little bit of finesse and a little bit of heft and a little bit of, you know, they have that touch that you can really tell when a Christian writes about Christians that there's a different, it just feels different. And I think they do a great job of that. But I also think there's great work going on at the Atlantic right now. I think they're really, they're really focusing on religion for some reason, which I love. So, you know, look at these stories because what's happening in those stories are what your, your congregation is sharing on social media, right? There was a Gallup story last week about how, um, church membership now is below 50%. It blew up. It was all over the place. People want to talk about this. People are interested in this. And I think, you know, pastors, you can, you can preach Easter Sunday, every Sunday or every year, you can preach, you know, Palm Sunday, every, you know, every year, at some point, your congregation wants something a little bit different. And I think social science can help give you more fodder, more content for your sermons that you're, you haven't seen before. So even something so simple as going on Google scholar, which is just great. Google has its own website just for academic work. Google what you're looking for and see if you can find an article or two. Now, a lot of them are going to be written in ways you can't understand, but you can read the conclusion and you can understand it that way, right? So start looking for stuff, Googling around stuff and go with trusted names because there's a lot of yahoos out there online who don't have any social science background that kind of fancy themselves social scientists and they're really not. So look for academics especially, but look for people who have had a long track record doing this kind of work. And there are some people out there who do. Christian Smith at Notre Dame is very good. Dave Campbell is very good. John Green's very good. Um, there's a lot of people who do really good work here that's objective. I think it's academically rigorous, empirically grounded. That that's what we should be focusing on now is 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 less partisan stuff and more objective work. Are any of your sermons available online? Uh no. The answer <laughs> to that question is no, they're not. Um, my congregation is only about fifteen people, and okay. we, um, you know, we record it, but I just never post it online. I try to I try to keep those two lives separate. You know, I, okay, I want. Okay. I, yeah, because for me, I'm in a really weird spot. Like in the book, for instance, the first four chapters are really just empirical social science, all descriptive right. stuff. But the chapter five is more like a pastor chapter. Like, here's how pastors should think about it. What's so funny is atheists love me because I'm actually writing about them and no one else is doing that. They read the, my book and all of them like, I love the first four chapters. I just stopped reading at chapter five. Right. <laughs> but then I have my evangelical friends who read the whole thing and love the whole thing. You know, right. so it's like, how do I how do I square all that stuff? Right. Like how do I make the, keep this audience happy while also keeping that right. audience? happy? Cause I want to be, I want to be a neutral referee for everybody, right? Like I don't want to be for this group or that group. So I'm really trying to thread the needle of not being too much of one thing or the other thing. Yeah. I appreciate that. I just thought when you mentioned uh, the suggestion to pastors was to do a sermon and incorporated some social science. So that maybe you had done that, but it sounds intriguing. Oh. I do it. I do it literally probably, I will say every Sunday, but probably at least once or twice a month, I bring in some sort of social science term. I'm always talking about culture, like the culture of Jesus time. We talk about Palm Sunday. We talk about the Roman empire and what it meant to be a member of the Roman empire. Like I'm always a big believer in like, we can't rip the gospel out of context because right. Jesus was a person and a place at a time that had political implications and religious implications and social implications. And once you understand that, you understand what the story meant at the time, it helps you understand the story of what it means for us, you know, like, I, you know, that kind of exegesis and hermeneutics together. I think a lot of pastors only focus on like four ways to be a better husband or three ways to be a better parent. I, that's fine. But I also think we need to understand the arc of history, right? Understanding the meta narrative of the Bible and where Jesus falls in the redemptive arc of human history. I want my people to be theologically educated. And I think they actually, and they're older, so I think they're more inclined to that anyway. But I read 30, 40 verses sometimes. I use a lectionary too, by the way, because I'm okay. kind of more high church, which actually is right. great because it forces you to do things you wouldn't normally do or talk about things you wouldn't normally talk about. But I love that. I love getting them in. I, we talk about the Old Testament a lot. So, you know, I think there's there's definitely room for pastors to do something different. I think your congregation is looking for that sometimes. Yeah, most definitely. Well, I have uh, appreciated uh, you're taking the time out. We could talk for hours. I don't know if the audience would be interested in it, but I certainly would. Uh, I appreciate your making the time to come on the program and for sharing your insights and talking about this wonderful book, Ryan. Thanks. I appreciate it so much. My guest has been uh, Ryan Birch. And again, he's the author of uh, a new book, The Nuns, Where They Came From, or where uh, Who They Are and Where They Are Going. And you can find that link in the uh, podcast description notes. And you can also find it on our website at multifaithmatters.org. And uh, this is John Moorhead, the host, and we thank you for uh, listening and for watching this episode.